First thing to say about Symphony Sid is that, you know, anybody who who heard him on the radio and uh, is familiar with him emceeing on the many live recordings from Birdland and the Royal Roost and everything, and say that he had his own language more or less. Uh, when I first came to the United States of America, uh, when they st we still had a real president, I, uh, uh, I was already, you know, very much into jazz. And as I said on uh, my 10 seconds on Ken Burns' jazz, I, I, what I wanted to see was not the Statue of Liberty or the Empire State Building, I wanted to see 52nd Street. That was really true. And I thought, naive as I was, uh, that New York would be a jazz paradise, which in a sense, in retrospect, it actually was. But I also thought that on the radio, and I spent the first night in New York, uh, with my father and me he had a little radio. I thought on the radio, I love to listen to radio at night. That was a habit I got into during the war in Europe when listening to the radio was a fascinating thing and it kept you in touch with your shortwave and all kinds of things. You could listen to news in Moscow and, and you know, whatever. And there were Nazi broadcasts and whatever. But that's a whole other story. But anyway, I turned on the radio and I thought there would be jazz all over the dial. Well, no such luck. But eventually, I found Symphony Sid. And that was, I didn't find him talking right away. I got into uh, the middle of a music, which was something boppish, which sounded strange enough to me, but certainly recognizable as jazz. And then this guy comes on, and I wasn't sure that I really understood everything he said. You know, I was like, <laughs> what is this? What? brand of American English is this, but that was Sid. You, you heard Sid, you know what he was like. So he, you know, he was a master of jive talk. Sid Torin, uh, his first radio show was called After School Swing Session, and it came, emanated from the Bronx, and it was on a small station. And it had a theme song by Louis Jordan, who actually, in his early days of recording, did record a number with that title. The person who told me that was Nat Lorber, we've talked about Nat, uh, who, you know, Nat was listening to that show when, you know, when he was in his late teens and everything. Sid was no youngster when he broke into jazz big time, so to speak. John Hammond told me that Symphony Sid, then Sid Torn, was working in a used record store. They also had new records, but they had new. And uh, John had met him, uh, the store wasn't even in New York, I think it was in, in New York City, I think it was in Brooklyn, and Sid was the guy that John Hammond appointed to look for Paramounts. <laughs> if he found any Paramounts, put them away and let John know. So this is something that when you know Sid only as the champion of bebop and modern jazz and you know, I think looking for Paramount 78 for John Hammond is, is, is a stretch. And Sid, as I found out, and I listened to him because he was really, at night, there was very little jazz. On, in the daytime, there were people like Ted Using, who was a big jazz fan, who was a, really a, a sports guy uh, on WNEW, and uh, you know various things. Uh, uh, Amy Govan, who was Dr. Jazz, and Rudy Blesch was on the air with, this is jazz, you know. 
Well, Woody Jazz really meant something very specific. <laughs> if it wasn't from New Orleans and it wasn't block and it wasn't music that didn't include any Tin Pan Alley tunes, it wasn't jazz. Shining Trumpets, which is one of the most prejudiced books about jazz. Now, Rudy is a whole other story, but uh, Sid was a champion of what he called the modern sounds and was significant in New York at least as a promoter of the Birdland, first the Royal Roost and then Birdland, and of records. It turned out later when they got into all that payola thing that he was on the tab for Capital, but Capital at the time, you know, Miles Davis, No Net, and all that were into a modern jazz period, Lenny Tristano. Okay. And Sid was plugging those things, but that was fine. I mean, it was damn good music, so there was nothing wrong with that. And Stan Kenton, who of course was Capitol's main jazz meal ticket, and he was a big Kenton promoter. Incidentally, off, you know, to the side on Kenton, I was curious. I didn't really, I, I liked some of Stan's stuff, but some of it, you know, I wasn't too crazy about. But I was interested, this is still in my pretty early days, uh, in in the USA, uh, there was a Carnegie Hall Kenton concert at which for which Symphony Sid was offering you could get discount ticket if you called in and something. So I decided to go, and it was very interesting. But what was most interesting and surprising to me, this was Carnegie Hall, was how much of the audience was black. And I didn't realize until then that, that Kenton had a, a considerable black following. You know. And uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why Sid played so much, because Sid was, was clearly also catering to a hip black audience. And he would do live broadcasts first from Royal Roost and then from uh, Birdland. And uh, he was actually a pretty terrible <laughs> MC. <laughs> but of course, what was being served up in the way of music was great. He did not speak in, uh, you know, in complete <laughs> sentences <laughs> at the time. And he, you know, interjected all this jive stuff. But uh, he was, you know, very committed. And he, he really did a lot of good. And of course, I mean, musicians liked him. Uh, Jumping with Symphony Sid, that was the theme here. Uh, but uh, he uh, was very strict. You called in, you could call in requests like you could on most of these, you know, DJ shows at the time. And we would tease him, my friends and I sometimes would tease him, we'd call in and ask for a Louis Armstrong record. I said, we don't play that kind of, we only play mo only modern jazz, you know, modern jazz, you know, the whole litany about that. Uh, and he really wouldn't. I mean, it wasn't only Louis, but other things that he, he would not play. He was, he was a purist in that sense. But that's why I think of John Hammond and the Paramounts, you know, because he knew better. I mean, he knew it. But he also made mistakes, and it was uh, uh, Roy who told me about something that he had said when he introduced Roy and made a mistake and linked Roy with something that the Roy never was linked with. I think it had something to do with, with Erskine Hawkins, I don't know. He had something about Bama State and the Roy says, on the air, you know, that's Erskine Hawkins, not me. So, and that's also because uh, uh, Sid was not always quite sober when he was on the air, and uh, he was on late, you know. This was a late show, and it ran until pretty early morning hours, like 2 o'clock or so when he signed off, I think. And uh, 
uh, he eventually lost the show. He got thrown off the. He was very successful in the sense that he started on a relatively small station and then got on to WJC, which was an ABC network station, and he was heard outside New York too. But there was a microphone slip when, you know, and, and, and I understand that because uh, I had a, a radio show on WBAI that I inherited from uh, from Martin Williams who had inherited it from Ned Hentoff and Ned Hentoff and Gunter Schuller started it. It was called The Scope of Jazz. And we also got, we, well, uh, there was then uh, an extension of it, uh, which was a Sunday afternoon drive jazz time show. And uh, uh, my friend Elliot Horn, who was the uh, PR person for RCA Victor Records and a very big jazz fan. He did a book about hep, hep talk, jive language and stuff. And we were on in the afternoon and all feeling pretty good. And there's a, uh, uh, Ira Gittler and Don Schlitten, I think, and David Himmelstein, who died recently, and, uh, and I, you know, and Elliot was a guest, and we played a record, I forget what it was, but it was a good one. And then, you know, the mic was supposed to be off, but Elliot said, man, that was a MF, you know. <laughs> and so we got thrown off the, uh, you know, WBAI, which was the most liberal and out, so they had all kinds of, you know, advanced poetry and who knows what. But I got Symphony Sid lost his gig, his Jay-Z gig, because of something like that. There was an obscenity or something that slipped out because of a mic that wasn't supposed to be open. And it was probably his fault because he was not, as I said, not always quite sober. But Sid was an influence. He, he had an impact even though, you know, it was not outside New York, it took a brief time when he was on Jay-Z, uh, because, you know, he would plug things and people would become aware of it. I mean, I'm sure he, he sold a number of records for, uh, for Dial, uh, small labels, uh, and he was, he was hip, uh, and as I said, you know, he goes back and, uh, that's Louis Jordan uh, after school swing session. He, he had roots, so to speak. Uh, I never got to know Sid. Uh, I met him a couple of times. I remember that he, he one time when I met him, he, he had some very fancy uh, moccasins, you know, uh, shoes, the kind of thing that a pimp might wear. <laughs> Uh, he was, you know, he was a character. I don't know whether you c could really have a deep conversation with him, but uh, he was certainly, in his own way, very effective on radio, and uh, he had a mission, and that was